Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. In today's video, we are going to be continuing our chapter by chapter analysis of The Intelligent Investor. And today we are going to be taking a look at chapter one. Now, for those of you who may not be following along with the series so far, again, I'm going to be doing a chapter by chapter analysis of this book because I believe that it is the absolute best book on investing ever written and it is one of my favorite books of all time. So if you wanna stay up to date and follow along with this series, then make sure that you subscribe to my channel as well as hit that little bell notification. Even if you are subscribed to my channel, I've been hearing that you know, YouTube just doesn't really promote these kinds of videos, which is kind of unfortunate. So if you do want to follow along, you really got to make sure you hit that bell notification so that you actually get notified when I post this series. But with that out of the way, let's now hop into the video. So chapter one of The Intelligent Investor is actually all about understanding the difference between investing and speculating or gambling in the stock market. This is a very important chapter in the book because The Intelligent Investor is all about long-term investing. This is not a get-rich-quick book, and it's not for speculators or people who want to gamble in the stock market. So the first chapter, again, is just really making the distinction between what is actually an investment and what is actually speculation. Now, what's also interesting about this chapter is that the first time that I read this, I realized that I was actually speculating in the stock market, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even know that I was gambling. So this is also a very eye-opening chapter and can kind of point out some of the bad habits that at least I had before I actually read the book and, be, and, and went down that path on becoming a long-term investor. This is an absolutely fantastic chapter, and I have a lot of great quotes that we are going to cover in today's video. So let's hop into the first one now. All right, the first quote is right here on page 18, and this says, an investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and an adequate return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. So right away, the intelligent investor is giving us its definition on investing and speculating. And investing is anything that requires thorough analysis, promises safety of your money essentially, and also provides an adequate return. If an investment does not meet these three key criteria, then we are essentially speculating. So now let's move on to the second passage, which is actually on the bottom of page 18. So this says, we must prevent our readers from accepting the common jargon, which applies to the term investor to anybody and everybody in the stock market. This passage is very clearly saying that not everyone participating in the stock market and not everyone who owns stocks is actually an investor. A lot of people who own stocks are actually speculators and they may not even know it. This is kind of interesting because the intelligent investor is basically saying that to actually be an investor requires that you meet some sort of certain criteria. And again, not everyone in the stock market is actually an investor. All right, now we're actually going to skip ahead a little bit in the book to page 36 where this says, an investor calculates what a stock is worth based on the value of its businesses. A speculator gambles that a stock will go up in price because somebody else will pay even more for it. As Graham once put it, investors judge the market price by established standards of value, while speculators base their standards of value upon the market price. For a speculator, the incessant stream of stock quotes is like oxygen. Cut it off, and he dies. For an investor, what Graham called quotational values matter much less. Graham urges you to invest only if you would be comfortable owning a stock, even if you had no way of knowing its daily share price. This one paragraph right here has so much gold in it. But the key takeaway from this paragraph is that investors focus and look to the underlying business to make investment decisions, and speculators look to what the share price is doing. If the share price is going up, then speculators are happy, and if the share price is going down, then speculators get upset, and they get unhappy, and they most likely will end up selling their positions. Whereas investors don't pay so much attention to the daily share price, or the daily quotational values, as Benjamin Graham puts it. They instead try to value the underlying business behind the share price, and then they make their investment decisions based on the business. Again, not on the share price. So if you are an investor, it's really important to focus on the actual business that you're investing in and not just get so caught up in what the daily share price is doing because that can actually cause you to go quite insane and cause you to have some serious anxiety because share prices just bounce around every single day and a lot of the time there is no meaning or reason behind a stock going up and down so much. So. Again, look to the business, not the share price. And then very quickly, the very bottom of this paragraph says that an investor should only invest in a company if they would be totally comfortable not actually knowing what its daily share price is. So again, this just says focus on the business and focus on owning and investing in businesses 
where you would be happy not even knowing what the share price is every single day. That is the best way to invest and it's the best way to long-term invest in my own opinion as well. So now let's move on to page 21 and there is a lot of gold on this page. So let's start at the top here where it says, outright speculation is neither illegal, immoral, nor for most people, fattening to the pocketbook. More than that, some speculation is necessary and unavoidable. For in many common stock situations, there are substantial possibilities of both profit and loss, and the risk therein must be assumed by someone. There is intelligent speculation, as there is intelligent investing, but there are many ways in which speculation may be unintelligent. Of these, the foremost are 1. Speculating when you think you are investing. 2. Speculating seriously instead of a pastime when you lack proper knowledge and skill for it. And 3. Risking more money in speculation than you can afford to lose. This page right here is very interesting to me because it's actually saying that speculation isn't illegal or immoral. It's just that you're most likely going to lose money if you are speculating. It then goes on to say that there is intelligent speculating and unintelligent speculating. And the number one reason for unintelligent speculating is speculators speculating when they don't know that they are actually speculating. So basically what that means is that if someone in the market is going to buy a stock and they don't do any research and they're really just buying a stock because they think that it's the, the, the price of that stock is going to continue going up, then they may actually be speculating when they don't even know that they're speculating. And I actually really resonate with this passage because my largest loss in the stock market ever came from me speculating when I thought that I was investing. I didn't know the difference between these two at the time, and I had some serious losses because I was investing in a very speculative and high-risk company. I was essentially gambling on this company, but I had no idea. The whole time, I thought that I was investing, and then by the time I figured out that, you know, I really messed up, I lost a lot of money. So again, this passage right here really, really resonates with me. And again, it's really important to know when you're actually speculating and when you are investing. Because it's again, it's not illegal to speculate, but if you are going to speculate, then there are some few key things that you should do just to at least limit your risk. And that's also why the third most unintelligent thing that you can do when you are speculating is simply risking more money than you can afford to lose. So if we are going to speculate, because speculating can be kind of fun once in a while, I'm going to be honest, but when we are speculating, we should just put in as much money as we are totally willing to lose and not put in any more than that, because again, speculating is quite risky. So now let's move on to the second paragraph on page 21, and this says, In our conservative view, every non-professional who operates on margin should recognize that he is ispo facto speculating, and it is his broker's duty so to advise him. And everyone who buys a so-called hot common stock issue or makes a purchase in any way similar thereto is either speculating or gambling. Speculation is always fascinating, and it can be a lot of fun while you're ahead of the game. If you do want to try your luck at it, put aside a portion, the smaller the better, of your capital in a separate fund for this purpose. Never add money to this account, just because the market has gone up and profits are rolling in. That's the time to be thinking about taking money out of your speculative fund. Never mingle your speculative and your investment operations in the same account, nor in any part of your thinking. Now, this paragraph right here actually has a few different key points, so let's break them down really quickly. The first point here says that anyone operating on margin is in fact speculating. And for those of you who may not know, going on margin is essentially borrowing money from your broker to invest. But if your stock ends up going down, your broker can actually force you to sell your position, take a pretty big loss, and use that money to pay them back. So going on margin and borrowing money or essentially taking on debt to invest, the book considers speculating. The next thing is that anyone who buys a hot stock or the hottest stock in the market is basically speculating and gambling. And I actually agree with this because typically the hottest stocks in the market are being driven by totally momentum and they're being driven by traders. They're totally separated by their fundamentals or sorry, they're totally separated from their fundamentals and they're just you know, everyone is just trying to predict what the price of this hot stock is going to be tomorrow, the next week, and a month from now. No one is really taking a look at that stock anymore as a long-term investment, or even if people are taking a look at that stock as a long-term investment, they don't realize how much risk there actually is in owning the hottest stock in the market. There is a lot of substantial risk to doing that. This is simply because the hottest stocks get the most attention, which causes their valuations to go up the most, and again, it gets so far away from their fundamentals. And as we saw in the introduction to the book, the higher the stock price goes in the short term, the less returns you can actually expect over the long term. And a stock can go so high that the future returns have nowhere to go but down. 
And this happens the most with the hottest stocks in the market. So the intelligent investor is basically saying, avoid the hottest stocks, it's speculating, it's gambling. And again, most investors would just be better off if they did avoid the hottest stocks in the market. Now, the last part of this paragraph is actually, in my opinion, the most important because it's explaining how to actually speculate properly. And the intelligent investor says that investors should have a, an investing account and a speculating account. And the speculating account should be totally separate and it should only have a little bit of your net worth in it. For example, if I have a $10,000 account, then personally, I would make my speculative account $500 to about $1,000, and I would max it out at about 10% of my overall investing portfolio. Then the intelligent investor is recommending that investors do not take money from their investing portfolio and continue funding their speculating portfolio. Put some money in your speculating portfolio and then never add to it. That is now just your play money and just leave that alone. You can speculate in there, you can have fun, but never mingle your speculating account with your investing account and to never mix your speculative thinking with your investing thinking. This also is another reason why it's really helpful to just keep the two portfolios totally separate because then your brain can kind of think like, okay, this is where I can speculate and this is where I can long-term invest. So that is really important to actually, if you do want to speculate. And I actually have my own personal speculative account. So I actually follow what the intelligent investor says right here too. All right, and now we are going to skip ahead really quick again to page 37 where it says, the intelligent investor has no interest in being temporarily right. To reach your long-term financial goals, you must be sustainably and reliably right. This quote right here is an interesting one because it's basically saying that the intelligent investor has no care or really doesn't get pleasure from being temporarily right on a stock. What intelligent investors care about is having a repeatable investment process that they can continue doing and replicating for literally decades. Because there's really no sense in like getting excited about getting lucky on a gamble that you took or just buying a stock and then having that stock double or triple or whatever and not having that process be repeatable that you can continue applying to your future investments. Because if you do want to build long-term wealth, then you're going to have to find an investment system that again, you can continue replicating and replicating over time and really get your portfolio compounding and getting that snowball effect. So intelligent investors need to find something that they can continue replicating and reproducing consistently for literally decades. All right, and now let's go back to page 23 where this says, few people were willing to consider seriously the possibility that the high rate of advance in the past means that stock prices are now too high, and hence that the wonderful results since 1949 would imply not very good, but bad results in the future. Basically what this page is saying is that from 1949 to about 1969, the stock market ran absolutely crazy. I believe the stock market did something like 6Xing in that 20 year period. And when this happened, a lot of people in the stock market thought that this type of high rate of advance would just continue going on forever and ever and ever in the future. They weren't really considering that a higher rate of advance over the past 20 years means that things are actually quite expensive right now. And since things are so expensive, we should actually expect our future returns to actually go down. That's why this passage is saying right here that the wonderful results from 1949 to 1969 should actually imply that we may see some bad results from 1969 onward. So let's actually go over and take a look at some historical stock charts to see what happened during this time frame and after 1969. This is, this is actually pretty interesting, so let's go and take a look. Right here we have the historical price of the S&P 500. And if we take a look right here at 1949, we can see that the S&P 500 was worth about $14 back in about May of 1949. So now if we fast forward all the way here to about 1968 and the beginning of 1969, the S&P 500 rose all the way up to 106. This is actually a return of about 700% which is a compounded annual growth rate of about 13%. So now let's go and take a look at how the stock market performed from about 1968 right here over to 1982. And we can see that the stock market was very volatile. It made some new highs right here. Then it crashed. Then it was bouncing around. Then it made some new highs right here again. And then it looks like it had this little mini crash panic thing. And near the end of 1982, the S&P 500 was only selling for $103 a share. So think about that. $103 a share in 1982, 
and right here at the end of 1968, the stock market was at $108. So over this 14 year period right here, the stock market essentially saw no returns and it was just being incredibly volatile. This is not the same story that we saw from 1949 to 1968, where the stock market was producing returns every single year it looked like, and the stock market 7x over that 20 years. Now there are two main takeaways that I get from this passage and from this example. And the first one is that past performance does not indicate that future returns should be expected. Again, from 1949 to 1968, the stock market went like basically straight up, but then from 1968 to 1982, there was a 14 year period where the stock market essentially did nothing. So if we were taking a look from 1949 to 1968, to make an estimation on what the stock market would look like in the future, we would have been absolutely wrong because the stock market essentially produced nothing. Now, the second key takeaway is that the higher stocks run in the short term and the more expensive stocks get in the short term, the less future returns we should actually expect. And again, we talked about this more in depth in the introduction to the book. So I'd recommend going and checking out that video if you wanna further understand what this means. But now let's move on to page 24 and this says, this is just another of an endless series of experiences over time that have demonstrated that the future of security prices is never predictable. This passage right here is incredibly important because it's basically saying that no investor knows where the future of stock prices are going to go. Like over the long term, we can make a pretty good estimate that stocks are going to continue going up because over the past 100 years, every single crash has just gone on higher. But over the next like three, five years or over the next month or year, no one has any freaking idea where the stock market is going to go or where stock prices are going to go. And as investors and as participants of the market, we just have to accept that we don't know what stock prices are going to do in the future. So for me, as an investor in the market, I really try to just not predict where the market is going to go. And I try to just remove all emotion from the daily stock price movements. And even if the stocks go down, I'm just like, no one can predict that. That's just part of being a participator in the market. All right, but now let's move on to page 26 where this says, consequently, we are forced to the conclusion that now toward the end of 1971, bond investment appears clearly preferable to stock investment. If we could be sure that this conclusion is right, we would have to advise the defensive investor to put all his money in bonds and none in common stocks until the current yield relationship changes significantly in favor of stocks. Now, this is actually a very, very important quote in The Intelligent Investor. And I'm not gonna lie to anyone, it took me like four read-throughs to really understand how important this was. And it took me like three years of investing in the stock market and studying the stock market to really understand this relationship between bonds and stocks. This is a very important relationship to understand. And you guys are lucky that I'm going to be explaining this to you on your first read-through because, man, I wish I knew this earlier. So basically what this page is saying is that at the end of 1971, bonds looked much more attractive than stocks. And Benjamin Graham was actually saying that if he could be sure that this environment where bonds are looking so much more attractive was going to last, then he would actually recommend that the defensive investor put all of their money into bonds and not own any stocks in their portfolio at all. So let's take a look at what bond yields were doing back in 1971 to really understand why this is. Right here, we can see that on May 31st of 1971, the 10 year bond yield was returning about 6.26%. Now, what this means is that an investor could simply go and buy a 10 year government bond and get a guaranteed 6.26% on their money every single year, again, not taking on any risk at all. Now, if we go and take a look at the historical price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500, we can see that in 1971, the price to earnings ratio was about 19. What this means is that the S&P 500 had about a 5.26% earnings yield. And to find the earnings yield, you simply take 100 and you divide it by the price to earnings ratio of the market. So 100 divided by 19 equals about a 5.26% earnings yield. And what the earnings yield represents is that if companies back in 1971 wanted to pay out 100% of their earnings as a dividend to shareholders, then they could pay about a 5.26% yield. Now remember, bond yields in 1971 were sitting above 6% and they were totally risk-free. So the risk-free rate was yielding more than stocks could. Now what's also interesting is that from 1971 to 1981, bond yields went absolutely crazy and they spiked all the way up to 15%. This means that an investor could simply go and buy the 10 year government bond and get a guaranteed 15% return. 
that is an absolutely fantastic guaranteed return. And if we take a look at what happened to the price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500 during this time, we can see that it dropped from about 20 in that 1971 period, all the way down to about seven in the 1980s. Yes, the price to earnings ratio of the entire S&P 500 was only seven in the 1980s. This is simply because so many investors were moving their money out of the stock market and over into the bond market because the bond market was yielding fantastic returns that were much better than the stock market. So there is this constant relationship and this constant flow of money between the bond market and the stock market. And Warren Buffett actually says that the bond market and interest rates act like gravity on stocks. So when the bond market is going up and bonds are yielding a lot more, then the valuations in the stock market go down because a lot of money is leaving the stock market and going over into the bond market. And then when bond yields start going down, that money slowly starts moving its way over into the stock market and then stock valuations start going up. And that's why really during 2021 and during 2020, um, when interest rates are essentially zero and bond yields are essentially zero, valuations in the stock market just go straight up and they just go crazy. That is because all that money that was in bonds is now yielding essentially nothing when you compare it to the yield that stocks are getting. So all that money again flows over into the stock market, stock valuations go up, and then if we do start seeing bond yields increasing and interest rates increasing, then that relationship will start to weigh more in favor of bonds and stock valuations will come back down. This is also why during 2021, and really what we're seeing right now, so many investors in the market are worried about the Fed raising interest rates and raising bond yields, because if that happens, then these high flying, high valuation stocks will start to see that scale tip a little bit and valuations will ultimately start coming back down. I mean, think about it. If tomorrow bonds started yielding 15% just out of nowhere like that, then so much money would leave the stock market. Like, think about a dividend stock paying 4% right now. If my dividend stock is paying 4%, but the government bond is paying 15%, which investment looks better? And you gotta take into account that, you know, government bonds are also totally risk-free. You just get that 15% no matter what. So that was a long explanation, but just understand um, that there is this constant relationship between bond yields and stock yields. And when bonds are high, stock valuations are lower. And when bond yields are low, stock valuations go higher because there's just constantly money trying to find the best return. Warren Buffett also says that every time an investor takes on a new investment, they should always compare the returns on that investment to what the government bonds are doing or the risk-free rate is doing. And I actually have a full dedicated video to how Warren Buffett values stocks and how he views this relationships between bond yields and interest rates and stock valuations. This is another very educational video on my channel that will totally explain this relationship in even more depth and show how to apply it to stock market investments and valuations in general. So if you are interested, I'll leave a link somewhere on the screen up here. I don't know which side it's gonna be on, but I would recommend going and checking out that video because again, it is very informative. But now let's move on to page 28 where this says, we shall repeat here without apology for the warning cannot be given too often that the investor cannot hope for better than average results by buying in new offerings or hot issues of any sort, meaning thereby those recommended for a quick profit. This page is super simple, there's not much to it. Benjamin Graham is just reminding us all again because he likes to give this warning that we cannot expect above average investment or good investment results if we are buying the hottest stocks in the market. He's also saying that we should not be buying stocks if they are recommended for a quick profit. So anytime that someone says, you know, you should go and buy this stock because it's going to go to the moon in the next six months or something like that, He's basically saying, avoid that. That is all hype. That is all speculating and you're basically gambling. All right, now let's move on to page 31. And this says, in his endeavor to select the most promising stocks, either for the near term or the long term future, the investor faces obstacles of two kinds. The first stemming from human fallibility and the second from the nature of his competition. He may be wrong in his estimate of the future, or even if he is right, the current market price may already fully reflect what he is anticipating. In the area of near-term selectivity, the current year's results of the company are generally common property on Wall Street. Next year's results, to the extent they are predictable, are already being carefully considered. Hence, the investor who selects issues chiefly on the basis of this year's superior results or on what he is told he may expect for next year is likely to find that others have done the same thing for the same reason. All right, so what this page is saying is that whenever we are taking a look at a new investment and trying to analyze a new investment, we are facing two main obstacles. One is that we may simply just be wrong in our, in our analysis and you know we might have some sort of human error. And then the second thing is that even if our analysis is right and we come to the conclusion that this stock is going to have 
incredible earnings this year and potentially even next year, there's a really good chance that other investors in the market have already come to the same conclusion and they have already bought that stock in anticipation of it having great earnings this year and next year, if next year's earnings are somewhat predictable. This is simply because when we are investing in the market, we are actually forward looking. We are already to an extent anticipating that this year is going to be a great year for this company and that next year is going to be a great year for this company. And again, if everyone in the market understands this and can anticipate this, then they tend to put their money in that stock ahead of time in anticipation for um, future earnings, which means that that stock may already bid up to a valuation where it's already anticipating future earnings and the value of that company is like already pricing in its future. This actually ties into one of my favorite quotes from the introduction to the book. And if you guys watched my first video, you know what this quote is, but it says, obvious prospects for physical growth in a business do not translate into obvious profits for investors. If everyone understands that something or a business is going to do well this year or next year, it most likely means that everyone has already bought it, which means that obvious prospects for that growth will not translate into obvious profits because the valuation is already reflecting those future growth. So now let's move on to page 39, and this is a really quick one. This says, the intelligent investor never dumps a stock purely because its share price has fallen. She always asks first whether the value of the company's underlying business has changed. This page is absolutely amazing because it's very plainly saying that investors do not sell their stocks just because the stock price has fallen. They only sell their stocks if something has changed or happened to the underlying fundamentals of the business, or if their estimated value of that business has changed. Basically, this is saying that investors do not look to the share price or what the share price is doing to make investment decisions. They always look to the underlying business and pay attention to what the underlying business is doing to decide on if they want to buy more or ultimately sell their position. So as investors, we should not be focusing so much on price, but we should be focusing on the underlying business and how it is performing and how it is doing. Now, finally, this is the last page that I want to share in this video, and it's actually the last page of the first chapter. And this is page 45 where it says, as Graham never stops reminding us, stocks do well or poorly in the future because the businesses behind them do well or poorly. Nothing more and nothing less. This passage right here on page 45 is honestly one of the best passages in the entire book. I reference this on my channel all the freaking time because it is just facts and it's just so true and I just love it. Basically what this page is saying is that if we want to make strong long-term investments, then we should actually focus on investing in the best businesses that look like they have the best futures. Because if that business can continue growing and going on to produce even more cash flow and profits for its investors, then ultimately its stock will reflect the underlying performance of the business. Because investors typically value businesses better if they are producing more cash flow and more profits and can ultimately return more profits and cash flow back to those investors. This passage is really just telling us that if we want a solid long-term investment, then we should focus on finding the best businesses. We should not focus on trying to find a stock price that is going to continue going up Instead, what we should do is try to find a business that is great and that we believe is going to be around for the long term. Once again, focus on the business, do not focus on the share price, and that is how we are going to find our best investments. All right, and that is going to wrap up chapter one of The Intelligent Investor, everyone. And if you enjoyed this video and you found it helpful in some way, then as always, please remember to leave a like on it. It really helps out my channel and it will really help out this video because unfortunately, again, YouTube does not push this kind of educational content around on YouTube. It's very unfortunate. It kind of sucks, but it is what it is. And again, if you do want to stay up to date and follow along with this Intelligent Investor series, then make sure you hit that bell icon beside the, the, the subscribe button because then you'll actually get notified when I post videos and you can stay up to date because otherwise you probably will not be notified when I post these videos. But that is going to wrap up the video, everyone. I think that this is going to be a very long video. So if you made it to the end of the video and you're actually still watching, then honestly, God bless you. You're the reason that I get to make videos like this. I am putting my heart, soul, and passion into making this series on The Intelligent Investor because I just think that there is so much gold in this book that I can share and present to all of you. And um, yeah, again, it's you guys watching this video all the way to the end that just really supports my channel and allows me to make this kind of content for you. So from the bottom of my heart, absolutely, I mean this. Thank you guys so much. I truly do appreciate it. And I really hope to see you all again in my next video. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you next time.